Hi and welcome <laughs> to Blank Body. It's a Vampire <laughs> the Masquerade V5 tabletop horror <laughs> podcast. <laughs> and we're talking about a lot of meat today. Yeah, oh, no. yeah, we are. There did you so much meat? In did this you episode. realize that uh, humans are made of meat? Yes. Uh, and sometimes when your meat stops abruptly, that's bad. Yeah, this, most uh, of the time. Most of the time, this episode kind of got away from me. It went from mm-hmm. being a one bonus episode to potent, essentially like part one of a four part series. Is it going to be four parts? Well, this is two parts, but it's a preamble to a preamble. Mm-hmm. But we'll get into that later. We're uh, we're talking about snuff today. Today, specific not cocaine. Yes. Um, uh, so specific. Damn. I guess you could call it urban legend or type of horror or fetish. Um, but uh, but what is it? Well, before what is it? I'm Hunter. I'm your host, like always, and I'm joined by Sarah. You're John. I am Sarah. Yeah. Okay. You, you, you're you're too high I'm, on the power I'm, of the Chicky Philly. I'm, I'm, I'm Chicky Philly drunk. <laughs> yeah, boy. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll sober you up with some sobering material. Oh, Facts sure. and logic and the horrors of humanity and the things we do to each other. Yeah. Hey. So um, this all started um, because I was replaying Bloodlines again, as you do. As you do. It's and, a classic. And one of my favorite uh, side quests, I guess you have to complete it to complete the game, but it's not a main mission. Whatever. It's in there. Um, involves a snuff tape. And I always thought it was really interesting. And so I did end up doing a bunch of reach search on that topic. And I was like, hey, I'll just make this into an episode. And it was on a poll I did w- with our Patreons on stuff that they'd be interested in me writing an episode about it. And this was one of the winners. So This is your fault. Yeah. This is you, all your fault. This is your guys' fault specifically. <laughs> yeah. So Like, like quite literally, we have documentation and a chart. Yeah. <laughs> like... Thanks for the help. Um <laughs> No, I, I love and appreciate you guys, but God damn it. Ugh. Yeah. So um, I will say I'm going to start with a little like history and um, backing. And then we will talk about more of the V5 thing side of things in the part two of this episode. So if you haven't somehow played that game yet. Um, haven't played Bloodlines. You got like two weeks to get through the L.A. section. Yep. Or the Hollywood section. Sorry. It's a, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it is a Hollywood, Hollywood section. section. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It's, it's about mid game. So it's not before the game gets super difficult mm-hmm. so you, you can do it in two weeks i believe in you yeah or you can like watch a walkthrough there's tons of really fun walkthroughs mm-hmm. of the game so you know it's not like it's been out for like what 15 years yeah yeah we've, we've talked about doing a bloodlines episode and we might but this is such a small side bit of lore that i, I figured it'd be a good way to dip our toes in and just talk about some weird horror stuff you know and considering world of darkness is a horror game yeah. We're going to be delving into a genre of horror. I just wasn't expecting us to start fucking balls deep immediately. <laughs> well, it's interesting because you know? it, it, this one's kind of balls deep, but kind of not. When you're talking about horror topics, we'll get into it. But this one's kind mm-hmm. of turns into be a little bit. Um, I'm going to jump out of order in the script a little bit and just throw the content warning here. Yeah, now, now, please, yep. now. So um, I tried not to be too graphic especially towards the few instances of real life events in this episode. And even though most of what we're covering today is actually fake, misleadingly marketed or both, there will be passing mention of murder, violence, sex, supernatural violence, standard horror stuff, as well as mention of real life murder, um, bestiality, and some necrophilia. Hey! Um, the lo- now, those Wild. heavier those heavier topics oh, will probably be in part two, and I'll have a stronger warning before we get into that, just so if someone's not comfy, they can skip a segment of the episode, or I, I try to put the, the easy listening hits up first. Cool. But, um, we're, he's, he's easing us into it. We're doing a warm-up. This is foreplay. Yeah. So what are we talking about? I mean, about? strangely enough and apt enough, that's how we uh, got um, that one friend to watch solo with us that's true yeah we had to ease him into it we had uh, over a whole year we have one friend that was just not exposed to a lot of horror genre stuff and also came from a very uh i guess we're gonna call it a religious background and we and they were like i want to get into this stuff and we're like are you sure and he went yeah and we just like a beta fish in a bag just slowly 
acclimated mm-hmm. them in. He specifically asked too, because we watched what was it, Poughkeepsie tapes? Yeah, we watched Poughkeepsie tapes, and he was mm-hmm. like, "Wow, that was fucked up. I want to see more like really fucked up stuff." And we were like, "We're all like, are you sure, my guy? Oh, all right." <laughs> and just had a whole series of movie nights. Like other friends got involved. Yep. It became an event. Until we got to the point where we watched, not only did we watch Salo, we watched such a Serbian film as a group, mm-hmm. and he's like, you know what, I think I'm done. <laughs> we were like, good. Cause good, because that, that was <laughs> that was about the end. That's yeah. about where we're at. We like, don't, we don't want to go any further. Oh, uh, God. That, that's one I don't recommend anyone watch. What, really. Serbian film? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, you can same. skip it. Same. Unless you are from Serbia and understand Serbian politics, there's nothing in that movie for you. It is an intelligent film, mm-hmm. but unless you understand the country that made it, there's no reason for you to dive into that pool. It won't make sense to no. you. It's it's like watching poli- political commentary in another language. It might as well just be like Coco Melon, but gory. Oh, oh God. Did I tell you about going to the Ralph Steadman Gallery years ago? That sounds cool. Yeah. So I was in the UK visiting family, and in London they had, in the British Cartooning Museum, a whole floor dedicated to a Ralph Steadman exhibit. And because I'm a huge fan of his art, he does a lot of the artwork, like the splatty ink designs that you see with like associated with Hunter S. Thompson. Yeah. For context. Yeah. So I was like, yeah, I want to go to this. So because he was working with Hunter S. Thompson, a lot of his works involved American politics in like the 70s and 80s. And I was the only American in the museum. So it was just me <laughs> enjoying myself and then having to explain like Ronald Reagan to British people. Hilarious. At the ripe age of like 20. <laughs> so, Yeah. Yeah, it's like that. <laughs> Just like, who is this man? I was like, the devil. <laughs> I... Hey, I'm technically related to the devil. You're related to Ronald Reagan? Yeah, he's like a great, great, great uncle. Oh, that's weird. weird. I did not know that. Yeah. That's so weird. That's why I, I've told you I'm related to the devil before. Because I used to introduce myself that way. That's amazing. I yeah. <laughs> Look, you're just full of so much like gnomish whimsy. I just assumed that was something you were saying for the ha-has. Mm-hmm. No, I'm really... We've been friends for 10 fucking years. How am I just <laughs> learning this? Yeah. Related, <laughs> I'm related to him and the guy who did the far side, Gary Larson. That I knew. Yeah, yeah I knew that one too. No. Both like distant enough relatives that like I probably couldn't just call him up and be like, what's up, buddy? Yeah. But like... But Interesting. You, you might show up in like a twenty three in me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. Anyway. Anyways, back to your back to the snuff. Yeah. So what is snuff? Um, well, I have a couple definitions. Um, the slang definition from dictionary dot com is a pornographic film that shows an actual murder of one of the performers, as at the end of a sadistic act. Um, Neat. Now, most agencies around the world that would investigate these sort of crimes define them as also requiring a sort of capitalistic intent i.e you're making the video for fun and profit Mm. so you have to so like like a porno you are filming it um you're filming the crime to then sell the video to someone else yeah that's the definition i'm most aware of that is not the or that's not how the urban legend starts we'll get into it but that is the most specific um definition that we know of and it's the most um the one that most places are going to agree on that's what like the cia and russian police and every agency that has ever (laughs) investigated this ever is going to use is that it, it requires capitalistic intent so if you shoot someone in the head send it to their relative and say if you don't pay me i'll do it to your other brother too it's not snuff because that's just blackmail you didn't sell it to them (laughs) that's just regular extortion yeah so they're so you are committing crimes that end in some sort of murder and selling the footage that is what a snuff footage is um it is often considered pornographic but it doesn't necessarily have to be sexual um, but that is often included in it. Mm-hmm. So, um, for example, if there's a hammer next to me, if I were to hit Skipper over the head with it and just release this episode for free, it would not be snuff. However, if we release this episode as a Patreon bonus with that, <laughs> then it would be a snuff <laughs> recording. <laughs> oh my God. I'm glad I'm on this side of the table. I'm going to be ready. <laughs> You, hey, listen, you're the guy with all the knives. That's why I felt safe. <laughs> I, I feel like you wouldn't actually feel like you were in danger. Yeah. Um, Skipper, you have a, uh, I'm going to call it a Boy Scout amounts of knives. I forgot my pokey one at home today. It makes me a little bit sad. Oh, no. Do you feel naked because you're missing one of your knives? No, it's fine. I have the other one in my pocket. <laughs> 
right. Fuck. All so, right. This stays with the pants. Yeah. So this is also why things like skate videos with fights and other crimes, things like jackass, extreme backyard wrestling, um, even something as reprehensible as like bum fights doesn't actually count as snuff. Yeah. Um, because while these are violent, um, sometimes sexual, always illegal things being filmed and sold, they're specifically not murdering someone to sell that footage. Even if someone, like, mm. we'll get into it later, but even, like, if someone dies in a boxing ring, technically that was not a murder. Right. So that, f- that might be negligent homicide. <laughs> yes. Technically not a murder. Though, um, yeah, I guess I'll share a little bit of personal information because it kind of ties into this definitional thing. So many years ago, I went through a weird hyperfixation phase where I was on FetLife and clicking through the links that let you... Uh, because they have hyperlinks that attach you to groups of like specific fetishes and kinks and whatnot. And I just went down the rabbit hole of just like the weirdest shit just because I was like, oh, what the fuck? How one, I was like, how far down this rabbit hole can I go? And two, like, how dark does it get? Like, how how wild can you get on this site before they start being like, no. <laughs> you are not allowed to do that here. And it's very far. It was back then. Um, I don't know how it is now with the the Sesta Fosta shit, but uh I ended up finding some communities that were, like, into snuff or snuff-related materials, but it was, like, very extreme consent, non-consent, where some of it was people were, like, into consent, non-consent that extreme, or it was people that, like, uh, at least online were saying that they were into, like, actual, like, pornographic snuff, but because they didn't have the money or the means to it, they didn't have access to it, so they had these, like, elaborate fantasies and scenarios and all sorts of stuff. And I went through a whole month period of interviewing one guy. It was it was my interview with a vampire, except it oh. was interview with a guy that was really into like murder porn. That's scary. It, yeah, it only ended up being scary at the end of the month because like the first like the whole chunk of the month was just me asking questions of like, why are you into this? How'd you get into this? Like it was just very me being like, I'm not judging you and I'm not mad. I just want to fucking understand like mm. how you got here as a person. Uh, might this been me low key uh working through my own traumas from my own personal bullshit? Probably, but <laughs> him and I ended up having this little bit of a rapport, and then at the end, I ended up like the thing that made me end up cutting ties with this guy was uh, uh, he got comfortable enough with me to start like expressing like the kinds of women that he was into having these fantasies about, and I had made some crack about. Uh, yeah, I guess I don't have to be worried about you coming to find me. And his response was, no, you're not my type. Like, immediately in the chat. And I went, oh, I gotta leave. Oh, he thought about it and actually, like, researched enough to, like, come to this just, oh, fuck. All right, I gotta, I gotta, ooh. Mm -hmm. I had a Cleary Starling moment. I gotta go. No. (laughs) So, yeah. (laughs) That's that's Sarah's misadventures on the internet. (laughs) You know, uh, to be super real, mm-hmm. I can't say I'm super surprised it ended that way. <laughs> Just considering, yeah. one, how things tend to go. What, for me? Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then, two, specifically the group of people you were interacting with, I feel like, uh. Uh, tend to go to the extreme anyway. Yeah, I <laughs> I will own I have some extreme interest in certain aspects of kink. But that is always done with explicit conversations ahead of time about, like, boundaries and safety and, like, consent checklists and all that kind of stuff. And unfortunately, this was also during the wild heydays of Fifty Shades of Grey. So there was just this massive influx of people into the kink community. had no idea what the fuck they were doing. Mm -hmm. And were being completely unsafe. And then just people getting into, like, really extreme shit that should not have been involved and just... So, yeah. you know, all right. It's almost like our brains were not built to be handling the amount of information and access to bullshit that we have. And now... Hint, hint. hint. Like I said, these these episodes were building up to things. Right? Um, extreme <laughs> access to things. I definitely... I think we talked about it before, but we just... We're of just the right age to be young and have the free time and access to the internet to get into some really terrible things. Like your interview with a... Uh, snuff fetishist yeah um story arc um 
<laughs> that I, whole meta. <laughs> I found myself in like chat rooms uh, with people who have ended up in the news later on, just been like, "Huh, video games got can get got got you some weird places in 2008." Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> so, um, anyway, uh, I will go back to the content warning again. So this episode, uh, this did get split into two episodes. Um, so this episode is mostly going to be fake, mismarketed, less extreme stuff. Mm-hmm. Next episode is where we're going to get into the questionable, is it actually? Um, mm-hmm. And then, but we'll also tame that out. We're going to talk, that's the episode we're going to get into the more World of Darkness lore, bring in some original ideas I have for how you could run these kind of things in your game. Um, so it'll be a little heavy and then the light fun stuff. Um, this is kind of, this is more the light dipping our toes in episode. Um, but I will put a little warning. This, this is us getting context for us handling the mature and darker themes we're going to get into. Hunter is good, bad, good sandwiching us. He really is. (laughs) He really is. (laughs) Um, So for my sources today, there are a lot. Um, a couple I want to point out is screenrant.com. Um, for a lot of research on these movies. Uh, I also did some research. It got put into part two, but from uh, the MoMA and New York Magazine. Um, there's some information from Britannica. Um, Cinematic Void podcast did a really interesting episode where they actually talk about the movies as movies. Took a couple of the ones they talked about in there that I thought were more interesting. Also, Fangoria is great. A lot of just like dark corner of internet research because some of these are do get into rumors and weird stuff Man- charles manson book the family comes up there's a lot of stuff coming up in here yeah. so oh can all i throw right. out a, a resource for listeners real quick before yeah. we get into it because it kind of yes ands what all everything you're doing so uh i'm a big fan of nick's fears on youtube nyx nyx like the, the greek goddess uh uh her name is may delightful creator little wacky little goofy but does tons of great uh media analysis on horror and does make her own like electronica music um but she's got an episode uh that is called the disturbing movie iceberg explained that she has done in sections but put together into a two and a half long hour long youtube video where she does a deep dive of one of the more infamous uh disturbing movie icebergs that have been done on the internet, but she does a really good job of breaking things down, but also trying to be like humanistic and compassionate and trying to give some like actual content context for everything that's going on. So oh, that's cool. a super good resource. And she's also hilarious as fuck. Yeah. Yay. I would also just go right ahead and say, unless you're a big movie fan, um, most of these movies, I'm not going to recommend you go out and watch. There's one or two exceptions that I think Sarah and I might bring up when we get to them. But for the most part, uh, most of these are movies that you can skip, most likely, unless you're just really into, like, horror movies, honestly. If you're just like, I haven't seen it, and it's a horror movie, I'll watch it, then, you know, you're going to watch it anyway. If if you want to have a horror movie night that's going to be a friendship test of a night. Some of these. Some of these are friendship tests. Yeah. (sighs) But before we get into the movies, we have to figure out where Snuff came from. Oh, yay! So... Snuff is mostly an urban legend. It starts August 9th, 1969. The Manson family murders happen. Yay! Um, no, it's th- bad. If you wanna if you wanna know about that, go listen to one of the thousands of true crime podcasts and YouTubers. I have some small details here, but they're much smarter people who've done like much more in-depth research on this. And we are talking about we're bringing this up for one very weird specific aspect um but if you don't know much about the manson murders um there were five people that were murdered including actress sharon tate who was eight months pregnant at the time which is part of why the crime became such a big yeah because she was i can't remember if they were married or not to roman polanski i think it was roman polanski no it is roman polanski i just can't remember if they were married yeah i i, I think they were married is what okay I'm saying. yeah i i specifically didn't put there because i didn't want it to be like She's important because she was married to a dude. No, she was but, actually like, an actress in her own right. Like, yeah. if you go to watch, uh, it was like, uh, The Fearless Vampire Hunters, great classic horror movie. Mm-hmm. She did a bunch of great stuff. But yeah, that's part of the reason why the news went, oh my God. Um, the and deaths. Late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, this, amongst other things happening in America, were really shaking the country up. Um, and all sorts of rumors start to spread about degeneracy, cults, the specifically the Manson murders, um 
rumors that the Manson family committed a bunch of other murders. Um, that they one of the big rumors was that they filmed the the big murders or other crimes. As far mm-hmm. as we know, that never actually happened. No footage was ever found. There was footage from them out at the ranch, but mm-hmm. I think the worst crime on it was them doing drugs. Like, there's no actual footage of them murdering anybody. Yeah, because most of the documentation of things from that that I'm aware of was uh, Charles trying to make it as a musician because he had that weird connection with the guy from the Beach Boys. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was just a weird, <laughs> it was a weird yeah, his, time period, his, man. His music's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I used some of his music in the um, video edit I have on our YouTube channel. But um, that aside, one of the first books that rushed out to cover the story at the time that sold really well was called The Family. This family, this book, The Family, has largely been discredited. It's Mm -hmm. not well researched. It's a lot of hearsay. But it is, as far as many people can tell, the first time Uh, the term snuff is used and it is specifically attributed to the Mansons um, filming the Tate murders. Um, So it's not even real, but that is um, where the urban legend of snuff itself exists. Um, And a lot of time, and Mm -hmm. also after that, it's like, Oh, well, you know, that's the thing the cartels are doing down in South America. And it kind of spirals. And part of that spiraling is the movie snuff in 1975. So the first, these are the films, movies, not real cinema section. Um, Snuff is not a great movie. It was originally titled The Slaughter, and it's late 60s, early 70s, like hippie, Manson, cult exploitation style film. It's really goofy. It's really boring. It is not worth your time to watch. <laughs> it was shot in the early 70s and then not released for like four or five years, and er- there is some debate that it may have gotten a small theater showing and no one gave a fuck, so it got shelved. Mm-hmm. Um, but either way, a distributor then decided, I got an idea. So he hired a second director to um, add an extra scene to the end of the movie. Where So the whole movie is basically just like hippies going around South America killing people, committing crimes. And then at the end, the camera pans out and the crew is like, wow, shooting this this murdery movie is getting me kind of horny. And then they like there's like a really bad sex scene that turns into a murder scene. And it looks like the crew killed someone after filming the movie. Hmm. And that's kind of like the framing device for this movie. Then what we'll see a lot of happening here, the same distributor hired fake protesters to stir up drama at showings, actually showing up to filmings of this new movie to protest it happening, (laughs) saying that this is a real murder. This is um, Mm -hmm. so much that the original director of the movie, The Slaughter, did not know that this was his movie until he went to see The Slaughter after hearing about it and went, huh, that was my movie. (laughs) Um, Amazing. That's how many hands this had gone through before it got to this point. Um, It also got to the point where the New York County District Attorney ended up having to investigate. Um, But I will add that the scene that he had to investigate is so graphic and so disturbing that it is available completely unedited on YouTube right now. It's pretty corny. Yeah. Um, Which I'm shocked it hasn't been struck on YouTube considering all the DMCA. It's it's like late 60s hammer, like vibrant red, like... It It looks more like red paint. It's probably literally red paint. Yeah. Like... Huh. It's it's I've watched it. You can literally, if you look up the movie, the first thing it says is, "Oh, you want to see the kill scene?" Like, yeah, it's on there. But um, this was like peak Carney Barker style promotion. But it's not really worth watching. But it is one of the first times that um the government actually had to investigate a film because they thought that the killings on it were real. That's the first time. Yeah, that's pretty common with a lot of these movies, though. Yeah. Yeah, you as we'll see. Yeah, <laughs> um, so yeah, the s- snuff or the slaughter, nineteen sixty nine, nineteen seventy five. I shot somewhere in there. It's not great. I'm not a big fan of seventies horror, especially seventies American horror, um, exploitation style stuff. I do like some seventies stuff, but like this specific era of like California exploitation, like kind of just gore show. It kind of sexy. 
It kind of depends because, like, some of it I enjoy just because it's just so fucking campy. This fall would fall. You can definitely watch this and laugh your way through it. Mm -hmm. Like, the actors in it are bad. Um, That's why it's, like, so funny that it was, I think that it was even investigated. Like, this is one you you only are going to watch if you want to see a bad movie. Mm -hmm. Um, You wouldn't even show this to someone to, like, shock them because, (laughs) like... They've probably seen, right. like, something more realistic these days on, like, NBC. Yeah, just in the context, though, like, the 70s, at least in film, was an era where people were getting themselves out from underneath all of the Hayes Code. True. So, uh, in the context of the time, this was very just like, <gasps> oh my god. And I think the direct or the distributor, not the director, hiring people to show up and protest enough people being like there's real murders in this film that they were like well we better look i guess yeah so um now the next one though is a big one Mm -hmm. uh we have 1980s cannibal holocaust oof yeah um now this one i used to be a big fan of this film i would consider it essential viewing for a um horror film fan um but I'll get to it later. But the, I now, if you haven't seen it, that's a big if about if you feel comfortable watching it or not. Um, so, But the movie Cannibal Holocaust, it's a story of a crew going missing after filming a documentary about cannibal tribes of the Amazon rainforest, uh, the return of their lost footage, and the revelations contained within it. Mm-hmm. So it starts with like an, an investigator trying to figure out what happened to uh, the, this news crew, we'll call them. Um, documentarians they they are able to recover some of the footage and they watch it and most of what you're watching is that refound footage of their invest of their journeys yeah there's wasn't it kind of one of the first found footage yeah it's technically like one of the first found footage films that at least got any mainstream like appeal as far as i know it's the first there's some there's a couple others that are kind of in that time mm-hmm. but i believe this is the first i think the other one it, big one came out like two years later but i could be wrong yeah i i have a weird soft spot for cannibal holocaust because for me it's also out in the same media timeline and media critique space as like the network yeah which i know is mm-hmm. like a weird thing a weird pedestal to be putting cannibal holocaust on again like i said i used to be a big uh fan of this movie i actually do defend like the message that this movie has and what it's trying to say Mm -hmm. um the methods of getting there though are more yeah it's uh, i i having a movie particularly in the 70s spending time to call out just the weird like colonial aspects of uh you know white people trying to make documentaries about other quote-unquote savage cultures but also just participating in like outer barbarity to get there is like a good message and probably something that should be investigated more. Well, but th- you also don't need to be like shooting animals. Yeah, we'll get into that aspect of it. But this movie came was shot in 79, came out in 80. Mm-hmm. Um, at this point, the Italian cannibal uh, like African horror movie was kind of on the way out i believe what is the modern one like green inferno green inferno it's, yeah it was it's, uh, it's a callback to fucking, that uh eli ross like callback and homage to those kinds of things and yeah. it's like i i'm not a i wasn't a fan but i i was bringing that up as like a modern film in that style yeah it's um, like i i like a lot of exploitation films those kind of like jungle exploitation films i've never been into uh, really because i'm always just like this is racist as fuck they're they are like inherently racist like the the whole premise is pretty fucked and not real for the most part Mm -hmm. and then um also they're like weirdly pulpy and pulpy but like not in a good way yeah and like as someone who i love like we'll get into it more later but like a giallo and like italian exploitation like the jungle stuff just does not highlight any of the stuff that those directors were good at. Nope. Um, that being in the woods is a free location to shoot. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, to get what you're talking about with the network, though, um, this movie is directed by uh, Ruggiero Diodato. Mm-hmm. Um, and this movie is largely his response to Italian news media at the time. Um, and especially its coverage of the Red Brigade terrorist attacks which were, um, I believe, remnant Marxist 
terrorists. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know a ton about the history of that time period in Italy. I know a little bit. Italian history is a is a weak point of mine, I will admit. Oh my God. But um, <laughs> essentially what he was saying is that he believed that a lot of the footage had been exaggerated or even faked by the media to portray yeah. the um, Marxist and communists still in Italy worse. Yeah, because like... <sighs> The network gets into this, but it, the 70s were a start of uh, mass media as we know it today, like just starting to kind of be a thing. And uh, there was a lot of pushes to basically entertainify hard news. And back in like uh, when the network came out in the mid 70s, that was like a wacky farcical like satire. Like if you go see interviews with people about that were in that film, it sounds like they're in a Borat movie. Yeah. The way they're talking about it. But if you watch it now, it is like chillingly haunting, like how fucking on point that movie was. Yeah. And that, and I mean, I, we're not going to get into mm-hmm. it, but that is still like a decade out from like the full 24 hour news cycle and like Columbine and yeah. like essentially them making anything up to say things to fill the air while filming the school while children are dying in it. Like mm-hmm. this is all preamble for mm-hmm. that sort yeah, of and, news media and a lot of things going on in the 60s and 70s up into the 80s there was a lot of big cultural shifts particularly in leftist spaces that uh involved uh, communism socialism and a lot of interactions with labor movements and various like ethnic groups like fighting for civil rights and all that kind of stuff so having media act in a retaliatory way by exaggerating things for their narrative uh, is a little little CIA. It's a little sketch. It's yeah. a problem. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what this movie is most known for um, is that it does contain real graphic fo- footage of the mutilation and killing of native animals, which is what this movie is mostly known for, other than some of its really good gore effects. Um, it has some really good gore effects, but yeah, the, yeah. the animal mutilation scenes in this is actually part of the reason why on every film when there's an animal, there was like, no animals were harmed in the making of this movie. This movie's the reason why that happened. Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, also, there's some questions on how they interacted with the locals who were in the film. Um, though, from what I've seen, a lot of locals apparently just had a great time. They made a ton of money. Um, and all the, a lot of the animals they killed, they got to eat. So they basically ate for free and like got to act and get paid a lot of money for them for it. So there are some questions about that. I'm not the one to say if that's good or bad. Um, but there is a sex scene in the film that over the last couple years, at least from my knowledge has come out as non-consensual and it is actually a sex scene um it is not like fake movie faked no 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 they they, they boink and uh yeah it's wicked uncomfortable being like oh that wasn't consent fuck mm-hmm. because that consent for actresses in films was very much not a thing in this time period like even another film that it this isn't sex related but uh the uh, the exorcist when they uh pulled the actress back during the the scene where reagan's like having the the, yeah, the they, psychic demon abilities and she they, gets like flung back across the room they had her tied to a board on a rope they basically had her on a harness and there was like a rope with one of the stunt guys like pulling her back to give more force to the fall and she had complained about it being like uncomfortable and then apparently the director told the stunt guy to just let her rip and he like permanently fucked up her back mm-hmm damn yeah Yeah. so that there though is the reason why i personally um don't just straight out recommend this as a this is a must see horror movie there are edits that don't have that sex scene in it um a lot of the tv edits i believe don't quote me on this it's been a year or two since i've seen i believe the shutter edit that's on right now has that edited out um i know they talk about it if you watch it I recommend watching the Joe Bob cut. He gives a lot of context for this. Um, I know he's kind of a controversial figure, but I think him and Darcy do a really good job of portraying why this movie is controversial, the upsides and downsides. Um, Oh yeah, no, Joe Bob Briggs does a really good job of contextualizing a lot of very culturally taboo or skirty films and cultural moments. And he's very, very smart. I've read a bunch of his books. 
Yeah, he writes books, guys. They're great. So I think the controversy with him is that he is from Texas. He mm-hmm. is a Texan, and he plays a character that is a very stereotypical, like, kind of redneck Texan, mm-hmm. which who, those, those people were making these kind of movies, too, and it's important. But what people also forget is that he was also involved in like 46th street and like early gay films and he was one of the only people reviewing them at the time and like very important like film figure and like yeah very tongue-in-cheek and he was probably saying the f slur back in like the 60s which is not cool but like i think he's just one of those figures that's like too important and too open-minded for the kind of person he was to really just write off yeah it, it's He also suffers from the fact because he does have a very southern accent of people just expecting and projecting certain cultural things on him. And I'm like, don't do that. Even if they are rednecks. There are tons of people that have southern twangs that are like really smart, well articulated people that mean well and are your homies. But, you know, has Joe Bob had some spicy takes over the years that I'm like, "Uh, I wish you I wish you did not. Yeah. But, you know, no. You people are complex. Yeah, people contain multitudes. Yes, but um, I would say if you're gonna watch it for the first time, maybe watch that. Um, but because of that one scene, I do need to warn people before just recommending that as wholeheartedly as I used to. Um, there's also been I didn't put this in the script, but there's been a lot, and what ended up getting unbanned because this film was banned for a while because of the animal footage. Mm -hmm. Um, but what they he Diodato and others were able to successfully argue was that there were a ton of other movies that are considered like classic all time films that had scenes that had worse animal mutilation in them, like Mm -hmm. Apocalypse Now. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Like scenes of just like cows being unloaded upon by machine guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like, he's like, they didn't even feed that to anybody. They're just like roulette loose on animals. But that's, that's considered one of the greatest films of all time, but I'm doing something different. And that's what actually got the British, um, like the video nasties. Yeah. And a couple other people that eventually unban the film. Um, but it did get banned, and um, Diodato was charged with obscenity. Um, this was in France. It was released in France. He was a char- charged with obscenity law. While that was happening, um, the people he worked with um, kept releasing the film in other countries, mm-hmm. and it was shown in France. Well, French magazine Photo um, published an article that um, seemingly, for no reason, claimed that some of the deaths in the film were real murders. Um, this article made it back to France, where his his case was then upgraded from obscenity to murder. So he was actually charged for murder. And one of the things he did was part of the agreement to be in this film. They had to sign an agreement that said that they would not appear in any films, advertisements, radio promotions, or anything for a full year uh, after the, the film the is released. Actors? Yes. Okay. Um, the four main crew, the four main actors, the four who go missing. Mm -hmm. um had to disappear completely which is why the french i believe the french article i couldn't actually track it down but i believe they're saying well no none of these people have done anything they've all disappeared (laughs) um and he had trouble getting them to come into court because technically he made them sign a legal document saying that they wouldn't do that um so no it's a public and media appearance Yeah. That's funny. So he was <laughs> like in court being like, I promise you, they're not dead. Um, eventually, he was able to get a hold of one of them who was able to contact the other three. And they mm-hmm. showed up in court and were like, hey, I'm alive. I'm here. What's up? And then um, they had some of the special FX crew come in and show like how they did. One, mm-hmm. I think the big scene that really... Um, without giving too much away, there's a big impalement scene. It's seen, it's portrayed on a lot of posters or like stills. Like this is one of the big scenes. So I don't think it's really spoiling anything. Yeah. But uh, if it, they had to like basically show how it was shot in court because even with like people showing up, they're like, that looks too real. No, the way they pull that stuff yeah, off that is great. fucking amazing. Cause basically what they did is the, the bottom of the post that the woman is being quote unquote impaled on. They just put a really thin bicycle seat. And then she's covered in mud and then just, like, sits on it. And then they just had, like, a stick that she would bite onto and then lifted her head up. Yeah, the chunk of balsa wood, actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like, fucking genius. Mm -hmm. Fucking genius. But, like, damn. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, again, people thought this was a real snuff film and they had to go into court to prove that it wasn't. Um, And I think that's been... um, yeah and it's also like at the point where this came out is like also the start of this cultural swing back with like 
the era of Reagan and like Thatcher. So there's like a big conservative swing back. So I'm not surprised that people are just like in a tizzy about this. And there's also the start of the time period where, like, the startings of the satanic panic and all sorts of just weird. And just like, oh, we can't have these things. It's obscene. Blah. Yeah. So, hooray. Um, we're going to jump backwards a little bit now. Ooh. Um, and this is the only movie that I would actually recommend if you're into, like, psychedelic or, like, giallo, like, Italian, noir, stabby films. I'd recommend uh, this one is Lizard in a Woman's Skin from 1971. This one's not as extreme as the others, but I thought it was kind of an interesting story. Um, so it is a psychedelic shallow film by Lucio Fulci, one of my favorite directors. And it does predate the other movies we've discussed so far. Um, a daughter of a rich politician delves into a dark world of drugs, murder, sex, and more. Dude, giallo film, slap, Lucio Fulci, a good time. This weird artsy Italian bullshit with like early proto-metal soundtracks <laughs> and yeah. like heavy gel lighting and dudes in leather driving gloves stabbing people with kitchen knives. <laughs> See, these are the kind of horror movies I like to put on when I'm uh, doing a Netflix and chill and I'm shocked that there's way more uh, Netflix than chilling that happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have a weird co- b- big chunk on my Blu-ray shelf that people are just like, I don't want to watch those. Uh, <laughs> we're just going to skip that. <laughs> um, but the more is uh, why we're talking about this on this episode. It's not even really a big scene in the movie, which is kind of wild. But um, even the Wikipedia has a whole section on it just called the dog scene. Mm, yep. Um, yep. The scene where the, um, the high on drugs young woman walks into a room that's full of a bunch of do- live dogs being experimented on, chopped mm-hmm. up, parts still moving around, guts being pulled out. It's not the best looking by today's standards. It's nothing worse than you'd see at probably like your local horror house. But again, 1971, people were not ready for that. Um, yeah. ag- again, um, they had to call people in to prove that this those weren't real dogs less they were just they were dogs so it wasn't too serious of a charge uh got him a two-year prison sentence that he was able to get out of because the special effects guy has just happened to have like one or two of the halved dogs still <laughs> in like a shed and was like no i got him right here <laughs> it's puppets <laughs> and they're like look it's a half a dog i mean also the the poor investigators were just like in an era where uh, the, the Soviet Union was known for doing lots of medical experiments that involved, unfortunately, just cutting apart dogs and sometimes monkeys Seeing and just kind of sewing them back together. Mm-hmm. Which I'm assuming that that was the inspiration for that part of the film. But Yeah, um, yeah I, if you want more information on that kind of stuff, there's uh, Jacob Geller has a little video essay about like head transplants. Cool. And the science of that, and also how that ties into like the Wolfenstein franchise, that's just like absolutely fascinating. Yeah, his... Did that surgery ever happen? I know what? there was that one guy who was like super terminally ill, and he had volunteered to get a head transplant. As far as I know, last I no. heard, he backed out because he got scared, which is valid. Yeah, because the only successful head transplant I am aware of was done to a monkey. And because of the way nerve uh, medical tech was at the time, they did not have a way to sew nerves together and have them be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. So the head was kept alive by the body, like pumping blood into the head. But the monkey had no control from the neck down because the nerves were severed. And uh, basically the body and the head rejected each other and the monkey died like nine days later. Brutal. Yeah. So I'm assuming medical tech is way better now. Yeah. But also I'm like, I would definitely want several more tests before we just start doing that. Oh, yeah. Before we start doing a Futurama. <laughs> like, fuck no. Yeah. So uh, we're going to jump back forward um, mm. a little Do-do. bit to 1985. Um, Do-do. And this one is kind Do-do. of a series. Do-do. Oh, no. Uh, I, I see what it is. Yep, we're talking fuck about you. the guinea pig movies. Fuck uh, you. I will say straight out. Fuck I'm, not a, I'm not a fan of these movies. No. Um, there are two series, actually. Um there is the Japanese series that we are talking about, um, and we are specifically talking about Guinea Pig Two: Flower of Flesh and Blood. Yep, this is this is on the disturbing movie uh, iceberg. Mm-hmm. If you want to hear uh, Nick Spears talks about this as well, so fuck. No. Uh, damn it. <laughs> so this original series is a series of six films, 
and I believe there's two or three making of documentaries. There's a couple documentaries about it. Um, they're somewhat low budget special effect best of films. Um, they started as adaptions of horror gore manga. Um, but the original director only did like the first two and then he dipped out and other people took over the series. Mm -hmm. Just horror movie series. You know, they, by the, by the fourth film, no one who was in the first film still involved. Usually no. Yeah. Um, but, uh, low in story, high in murder, torture and gore. Um, they are very much like, you could argue that these, you could argue that to some people, these are pornographic. Um, they're also just like special effects artists doing their thing. Mm -hmm. Um, there is also the American series, American Guinea Pig, which is more modern and is like a tribute to these original films. Mm. I'm also not a fan of them. No. So I can't really talk about most of these. Um, I did watch part of this one. I did watch this one, actually. I think I believe I watched the whole thing. It's not very long. It's not very good. But um, we're specifically talking about Flower of Flesh and Blood, sometimes called Flowers. Um, and there are multiple controversies about this one. Um, yeah. This is what makes this one really interesting. But let's talk about the movie itself a little bit. Um, so the film opens with Japanese text, which is importantly cut out from most of the bootlegs that made it overseas. That'll come up later. But it starts with uh, Japanese text. Um, reading that the director of the original guinea pig film um, had received this footage in the mail, like on a little reel, a film, and it was simply labeled, From a Fan. That's the, not ominous at all. The first film was already basically just like gore porn. And then mm -hmm. this one is... So we're we're also way down the meta rabbit hole already within like 10, 20 years of this urban legend starting. We're already having films making snuff sequels to themselves, basically. Before The Human Centipede did it in the 2000s. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, literally, the rest of the film is a samurai injecting a kidnapped woman with drugs to make her quote feel like a flower before dismembering her um i believe that there may be something more poetic to it that's been completely lost in translation um possibly i'm uh... i assume that there's at least a little bit more play on words of mm -hmm. the title and the yeah I, I feeling like a flower probably means something more yeah i i don't have enough cultural context within like japanese history and culture to fully understand like i'm assuming there's a lot of puns and nuances and shit in this uh i have seen this i did watch it uh in my early 20s so i have a vague memory of this because i was probably drunk during the movie night for this and yeah it and when i did watch this it was also during the era of like torture porn in the united states and i was just so fucking over all of that kind of shit that i'm just like i kind of tuned this one out as best i could yeah i also was never super into those films like the saw movies or like the um like euro extreme film movement or a lot of that just never did anything for me so these more vintage gore films also never really interested me it's also one that like you know if you're gonna enjoy this movie from the premise i described there's nothing more to it there's no character there's no story there's no plot there's no surprise it's literally a yeah. man dressed like a samurai dismembering a woman with mixed quality special effects um some of it looks uncomfortably good some of it looks like shit um <laughs> so yeah greg was in the other day and he just used literally a garden hose for that artery i so. mean considering some <laughs> japanese horror movies and special effects i've seen i am to believe that people in japan not only are full of inordinate amounts of blood that is pressurized <laughs> in a way that makes no sense and sometimes it spins <laughs> yeah. uh, it, so th here's where this one stops being fun in 1988 to 1989, the, the otaku murderer terrorized Japan. Um, he, In those two years, he abducted four young girls, murdered, dismembered them, and did un other unsatisfactory things with them. Gross. I'm Was not he... going to go down that true crime rabbit hole, but <sighs> not good things were happening. Yeah. Um, and it was fucking awful. Um. After he was caught, he was found to have a guinea pig film in his extensive collection of horror and porn films. 
I've heard everything from him having like 51,000 films or something like that. Just an extreme amount of movies. Um, but the Japanese uh, media at the time misrepresented it. Maybe they weren't told. Maybe they misunderstood. But they believed it was mostly manga and anime which is where he got his nickname, the otaku murderer, though mm. later it was came out that he mostly just had a lot of horror and movies and porn. Mm. And less like, he was less like, I'm really into anime, which is what <laughs> they classified him as. It's basically just like an anime nerd. This, like, is, this is the equivalent of some guy having a fuckload of Marvel comics. Yes. And then murdering somebody, several people, but whilst wearing a Captain America shirt. Yeah. And then people are like, it's the Marvel killer. And it's like, Nah, he just had a bunch of paramilitary shit and porn. <laughs> yeah, or, they, or yeah, or they, he has a bunch of that shit, and they're like, "Oh, he's the Punisher killer." Oh God, and some stupid like that. Should like, I make the spicy joke? Um, should I make the spicy joke? We're on. The spicy... What's the difference? Oh no, my response was going to be like, "That's just cops." But anyways, <laughs> <laughs> you guys don't understand the comics. Moving on. Uh, yeah. So the movie that he had was attributed at the time as a copycat situation that he had seen, um, a flower of flesh and blood, mm. guinea pig two, and uh, tried to reenact scenes from the film in his crimes. Here's the problem. Oh, later. here's where the problem kicks in. Well, here's the problem <laughs> with that assertion and its yes. relation to this film. Fair. Um, it was later revealed that he had guinea pig four. Um, so he didn't even have the two. He which, had four. Which it was a different film ah. um, shot by an entirely different crew. Um, and the fourth one isn't about a man abducting woman. It's about, I believe, an Asian woman doctor committing mm -hmm. experiments on people. So it doesn't even really fit the premise of him reenacting it. Um, yeah, I don't think I've seen Guinea Pig 4. I, they're not great. I've seen clips of all of them, but yeah. it's just not my thing. No, it's fair. Um, I was just like, yeah, no, I don't think I have. So that is that is the original controversy. Mm. Then we get the next controversy. Oh, yay, there's more. Yeah, there's, there's more. There's I love there's this more. for us. So this story is potentially apocryphal, mm -hmm. um, and it's hard to track down the exact details of this. Um, it's told in multiple places. Pretty much everywhere I looked it up to was also like story of a friend of a guy who knew someone involved. But it's become like horror movie urban legends. So I figured it'd be worth sharing too. Mm -hmm. um, somehow in the early 90s, this film came out in um, 85. Mm -hmm. so at some point in the early 90s, a copy of Guinea Pig 2, A Flower of Flesh and Blood, made its way into the hands of Charlie Sheen. Oh, Jesus <laughs> Christ. All right. Some say it was um, a bootleg given to him by Chris Gore. He writes for Film Threat and Fangoria and mm -hmm. stuff. Makes sense by the name. Um, some say it was like a compilation of Gore shots from a bunch of different movies. Either way, it's like a grainy VHS Oh, yeah, because we've, we've watched a bunch of like VHS hells where people would like record clips of bullshit onto a tape and then pass that tape along. Somebody else would add another clip and it would just be this whole stream of consciousness, like insanity stream yeah, for like I, an hour and a half. So this, like those lost VHS. That, yeah. 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 I, I'm really, they were also, they're also VHS called college. Tapes. They're also called college tapes, uh, video mix tapes. I used to be really big into collecting them. I have a pretty sizable collection still, but they're essentially, we're just people making like, the way you'd make your friend a mixtape of music, it'd be people making the like clips of like gory scenes from movies that they thought cool or and passing it to other like horror fans. Like this shit would get sold at like horror movie conventions and video conventions and yeah. I think there wasn't there like a whole subculture of people like mailing tapes like this to each other oh, yeah. and like having newsletters and shit. There's like a that. whole ta ta tape trade, like mm -hmm. um some of that still exists to this day. Um, we even have local conventions and stuff. Somehow, Charlie Sheen got a copy of <laughs> Guinea Pig well, 2. It's Charlie, no. fucking um, Sheen. Charlie fucking Sheen. And this was 90s Charlie Sheen, so he was definitely in his, like, coke wolf yeah. era. Mm -hmm. um, and in that haze of an existence, he watched um, this. Um, he thought what he saw was real and called the FBI. You know what good on him, though? Yeah, like, that is... If he thought it was real. Yeah, like, if he legit was like, oh, fuck, I'm watching somebody get murdered. And and we also don't know if what he saw, like, a clip or two of, like, the more realistic scenes mixed up between, like, obviously fake stuff. And he's like, wait, something's fucked up. But anyway, mm -hmm. he ended up giving his copy to the FBI. Um, 
and they did investigate. Um, from what little information I could find about their investigation, they literally just watched one of the making of documentaries and went, oh, okay, cool. We're done. That was literally the whole investigation. You know, that must have been a good day in the office, though. um, Mm -hmm. You're like, I don't actually have to go out and look at a dead body. Sick. So this has become an urban legend of the urban legend of snuff film. So I thought it was interesting enough to bring up. That's fun. Um, This this specific one just keeps getting more and more meta. So (laughs) yeah. Um, Oh, like if we pause right here for a moment, uh, it kind of ties into the plot of the movie Eight Millimeter. If you've ever seen that, yeah, you suggested. Uh, I haven't seen. I'm shocked that that's not on your list for the script, but I think it's just because it's like an actual film about snuff films. So maybe it's a little too meta. I specifically was went with films that weren't about snuff films, but were thought to be. Yeah, that this is eight millimeter. I feel like if you're wanting to write for World of Darkness, that is definitely a good resource for plot and setting and mood. It's also just you know a fucking good movie, and Nick Cage is in it, so I'll you know Cage. I'll try Cage. And, I'll try and watch this this week, and then maybe I can add some notes to it for part two. Hell yeah, because part two we're gonna have more of the actual like more fiction stuff, cool, and the more real stuff. Yeah, evil sandwich. Um. So there are a couple more uh, guinea pig notes I have. Jesus Christ. All right. Strap in. In 1992, a man in the UK was fined 600 euros. 600 pounds? Yeah, sorry. 600 pounds. Not euros yet. Um, 600 pounds as if he had imported a real snuff film because the court argued, quote, it was so well simulated that it is the same as the impression it creates. So essentially they're like, it's so realistic that you essentially have a real snuff film anyway and we're charging you. Kind of video nasties. I'm not surprised. It's the fucking British courts. God yeah. fucking damn. Yeah. Okay. There's times where I am really proud of being an American because we do have the First Amendment and it's kind of sick. Uh, but also the America has its own weird... Uh, self-censorship bullshit that did not exist when I've lived in the UK that I'm just like okay cool I can I can watch people get murdered and investigating horrific crimes and corpse autopsies and all that shit at any point during the day on TV but a nipple is gonna throw everyone through a fucking loop that's true but Um, then the British are just like oh my god there's some corn syrup and I've, I've got a feeling about it no I just never. I just wish I could be in the room with a bunch of dorks in white powdered wigs having to watch Guinea Pig too. Yes, and then them yes. being, and then them being so uncomfortable that they're like, "Fine him anyway." I had to see it. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to watch a Tory be upset by Guinea Pig too. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck yeah! All right, and the last one's kind of fun. I got one more note. Um, Skinny Puppy is said to have played footage from the film behind them at some of their live shows um and it also stirred up some minor controversy because some I'm people are like surprised. why did you show footage of a real murder at your concert that's not cool but yeah. it wasn't a real murder so that's you know. pretty sick honestly yeah like, this this th- for skinny puppy that's that's, that's an pretty appropriate sick. thing to have yeah, in yeah. I, I think this was also during that time period where there was just uh, a lot of goth and metal like shock issues happening in pop culture and people were just like Oh my God, people are doing all these crazy things at shows. How, how dare you listen to this devil music? I, I was in a DB band and I mean, we we played like bars and stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, I remember one time they're like, you have any video you want to play where you have? Well, you got a VHS player hooked oh, up to the projector. Fun. And for some reason, in one of our merch booths, we had a copy of Faces of Death 2. Hell yeah. So we just played that behind our set once. So Hell like, yeah. I get it. That's just like a thing metal bands do. I, 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 if you're in the audience and weren't comfortable with that, I am a little sorry, but like you did go do a D beat show. So, um, <laughs> I would expect it at the D beat show. <laughs> yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll get to faces of death, but I have one more of the like fully just like Hollywood movies to talk about. And, um, that is Blair witch from 1993. Yay. Um, surprisingly, because this film's not really gory or anything, but, no. um, Blair witch is like cannibal Holocaust. Uh, the story of a film crew, that uh, goes out into the woods looking into rumors of hauntings and witchcraft in a small American town. Uh, the crew then goes missing. Their footage appears. And the revelation that's on the footage. Wow. Yeah, because I was like, I remember this was like the first movie with an internet campaign that went viral. Yeah, so... Like, we were at, like, the peak age group for this when the movie came out. Mm-hmm. I, that's specifically why I brought this one up, although it seems a little cornier compared to some of the others on this list. Mm-hmm. Um, they basically did everything that these previous films did to stir up controversy, mm-hmm. but, like, right as the internet was popping, um, 
They um, they also asked the cast to go media silent for a period after the film came out so no one could get a hold of the cast um, who was seen in the film. Um, they were fake websites that were made to look like pre-movie talking about like the Blair Witch and Burkittsville and like rumors of stories going back like hundreds of years to build this lore up. Um, there's also a VHS documentary that they put out as if it was real. Although it's really, I have a copy of it. It's really funny. It's a blockbuster exclusive, and it says it like five times at the Hell beginning. Hell yeah! But other, I well, otherwise, I believe they showed on TV once, but you could only physically buy it at Blockbuster. <laughs> but like, people really thought that this was like a real documentary when it was coming mm -hmm. out. Um, and if you haven't seen Blair Witch, I won't ruin it for you. Um, but Big spoilers for like a what a twenty plus, 20 year, plus old year old movie, yeah, yeah. yeah. twenty year old movie. I, just because I feel like it's come semi culturally relevant again. Um, I won't, I won't spoil it, but, um, because people thought it was so real, um, people thought that the iconic final, final scene of that movie was real, which mm -hmm. pushes this movie into people thinking it was a snuff film, mm -hmm. um, or found footage of a real documentary with people dying. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's huh. like a combination of some people, some people were whacked out and thought it was like actually supernatural did it. I knew more people that were concerned that this was a documentary of, like, one of the campers going insane and offing everybody in the group. And they, like, refused. Somebody's mom, like, refused to let them any of them watch that movie because they're just like, no. <laughs> yeah, and there's stories of people saying that, oh, there's a serial killer out in the woods. Not mm -hmm. not actually saying, oh, it's witchcraft. Or, like, oh, it's weird rednecks killing people. Like, there were all kinds of rumors. But there were rumors that people thought this was real. People saw the documentaries and the websites, and they mm -hmm. thought all of that was real. And then when the movie came out, it was, they are like, oh, this is real footage of p these campers who went missing. Wild. So. Right. Mm -hmm. So wild. I mean, they're 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 they starting way back then. We see it on the TV. It's got to be real. Oh yeah, that's just been a problem for ages. I feel like we're better at it now than we were then. Uh, this yeah. movie also, like we said, came out right at that point where the internet was. It was just like ninety eight. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, ninety three. I thought it came out ninety eight. Ninety three. I have mem I have memories of fucking Blair Witch coming out on Mandala Effect. Let's double check because I could have sworn it was 98 because it's like I remember watching my one of my earliest memories is watching the Waco uh, church burning disaster issue in like 94. Yeah, you're right. It's 99. Hey, okay, there sure. we go. And then Curse of the Blair Witch was 98, 99. That was the fake documentary they put out. Yeah. Um, I will defend. Where did I get Blair Witch in my Book notes? of Shadows? I think it's because if you typed in the numbers on your board. Or it's like in the little square, the three and the nine are in the same row. You might have just had a dyslexia moment. Maybe. Which uh, is totally fine. It's whatever. Way, 99, I am I'm very sorry. Um, but the I will also note that the second film, which kind of fucking sucks, also tried the same thing where yeah. they also put out a fake documentary before it. Um, I'll I'll defend Book of Shadows as a film, but it's supposed to be it's supposed to be a meta critique on people reacting to Blair Witch the way they did. Well, it's supposed to, but even the directors hate it because they weren't given the time or budget they needed to make exactly. it properly. So it's like I'll defend it. I'm not saying it's a good movie, but I will defend yeah. it for them trying. They tried. Uh, the studio interfered and ruined it. It's not on them. No, but it it is. I think the movie kind of sucks. Oh, so um, Hot Goth Lady. Hell yeah. There's some Hot Goth Lady. Uh, if you can find it, it's near impossible to find. Um, I do have some if you want to wa watch them in the server sometime. Mm. But they also had a TV series at this time called Freaky Links that was Freaky really Links. good. Um, that Freaky. also tried to do the uh, this is real uh, kind of thing. Yeah. Um, I believe it's on sci-fi, but um, they had a website where the, the whole thing was the crew would go and investigate hauntings and supernatural happenings and then write and post about it on their website. Well, the website kept up with the TV show. So, like, you could watch the TV show and then read the blog about oh, what was going okay. on. And there's, like, more footage on the website that wasn't in the episode. Like, you got to see what's happening on the other cameras and stuff. Like, huh. it's kind of it's cool. It's really hard to track down. And I don't even know if the website exists anymore. Um, Hopefully it's on the Internet Archive, at least. But the copies that I have of the episodes like still have like burnt in like sci-fi channel logo and parts yeah. of some of the episodes are missing and like it's it's kind of a rough one to watch it it, it was really cool so i will give them credit they kept trying to do that stick and they did it well mm -hmm. um all right so we're getting kind of close to the end of this episode 
but I did want to put some documentaries here. This is how we slowly slide from the like, okay, we're talking about like movies and some like fucked up stuff and some fun controversies. We got a Charlie Sheen cameo. <laughs> and now Hunter is slowly, slowly cranking the, the temperature on our frog pot of bullshit. Yeah, so this is where things get spicy. God damn it. Um, and this is, if you if you were intrigued by anything I talked about previously, I guess Blair Witch is also a film I would recommend you, you watch freely. Uh, unlike mm -hmm. the others, that one's just fine to watch. There's nothing too extreme about it. Um, I just, I actually would really like it. It's that actually, movie. yeah, no, Blair Watch. Witch is really I really solid. Need to re rewatch it. It's been a long time. There's some really cool stuff with the audio design on the Blair Witch that I love, where uh, the director was uh, instruct had instructed the cast on where they were going through the woods, but he would circumvent them and set things up so that there were speakers in the woods playing like low tier sounds to fuck with the crew. And then also he did recordings of ambient, like just wind rustling through the woods and that mixed that into the audio of the Blair Witch film. So it's like audio editing wise, that film is fucking fascinating. Mm, yeah. yeah. The new Blair Witch is really good too. Really. Oh yeah. It, really? It's also just called the Blair Witch. I really liked it. Yeah. Oh, oh, I have okay. to check it out. I did I not watch it. I didn't give it a chance. Honestly, I should have. Uh, all the trailers g gave me a lot of, uh, oh, fuck. What's the what's the franchise that will not stop with the demons? So there's like two or three scenes like that in the entire film, and that's the entire trailer. Okay. Essentially, it's one of those where, like, if that's the kind of movie you want, you're going to be disappointed. But it is, I think, a really good sequel to the original film. You could watch, I would recommend you watch the original documentary, the original film, and then the this the new one. Okay. You could watch the second documentary and the second movie. I say it kind of weird taste in the middle either way um it's like the sandwich you're trying to give us it's got a weird taste in the middle yeah <laughs> fuck you so um so here's where things are actually going to get spicy we're talking about documentaries which means most of this is real but uh, this one is is a weird mixed bag yeah um so we're we're going to back to 78 um and we're talking about the faces of death series Boo. Um, no. another one of the ones that I feel like a lot of horror heads like no. will push on each other, but really not worth watching. I would say no. personally. Mm -hmm. Um, so faces of death is a compilation of real and fake footage. Um, a lot of fake footage. Yeah. yeah, mostly. So it's fake scenes shot for the movie that in hindsight, that don't look as realistic as they did to the eye of people back in 1978. If we're being yeah. honest, um, mm -hmm. the acting's not great, too. Mm -hmm. um, there's also stock footage from older documentaries that have been re-edited and narrated, as well as, like, news B-roll that's been re-edited and narrated over. So none of this was filmed specifically for it um the real footage none of the real footage of like actual really terrible things happening mm -hmm. for, as far as i can find was actually shot for this it was mostly news footage and older documentary like footage that was re-edited and just put into like this horror show of clips essentially mm -hmm. um these also bring in to the discussion of exoticism and our own distancing of where our food comes from which I yeah. think makes these hard to watch, too, because a lot of it is like crazy shit like, oh, it's a tr African tribesman slaughtering a cow and butchering it for dinner. But it's like, yeah, but your bitch ass a McDonald's like yeah. you're not that any different from that man mm -hmm. on yeah. any level other than you have this weird false moral sense of difference because you weren't the one who put the cow to death. Yeah. If you right. want to if you want to watch somebody in some sort of an indigenous culture slaughter an animal and then have the food prepared there are several episodes of anthony bourdain's no reservations that you can just watch so good uh yeah. r.i.p my guy but yeah there's there's a lot of footage of that like in these films mm -hmm. which is also why i wouldn't recommend it um it's very like just exoticism like yeah oh look at look at these savages so look at them giving birth in a in a mud puddle like just yeah, weird shit like, like that faces of death like the, the series of faces of death because i believe there's like three or four there, of these it's one of those things where there's faces of death and then there's like traces of death and yeah. like a bunch of other series with slightly different names and like yeah, there's this whole thing and then also a lot of the mondo kane like series I have that right there. you do uh and also <sighs> next to it i also have 
weird and bizarre world and like amazing videos volume two like, yeah it's they're just, all in the same it's all in the same camp and a lot of it unfortunately at least when you get into like the cross-cultural shit does unfortunately just like loop back into this weird western white supremacy of like look how you live in this like civilized society where there's order and da 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 and then these people outside of it have chaos and they don't understand how to control things and they have these savage natures and look at the brutality of man and blah and it's just like, bruh, this was in the 70s and 80s in parts of Latin America and Africa where these people have been getting exploited, like, physically and economically for fucking centuries. And then you're suddenly foisting your idea of how society should be on top of them and you've not even given them the chance to, like, get themselves up on their own goddamn feet. Like, yeah, of course shit's gonna be fucked. And there's also just, you know, the parts of Mondo Kane. Like, it's like, isn't there, like, two or three instances of the guys from the Mondo Kane series, like paying rebels in like these african countries they went to to like capture people or beat them up or hang them and just crazy shit and you're just like bro what the fuck yeah they are that's why i put them in this this is that section that is not fun um faces of death as far as i know is mostly like car accident footage where like mm -hmm. wow that guy got decapitated and some news channel caught it We'll, that guy we'll is meat now. The footage. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff like that. And again, all these old documentary B-rolls and footage where like, it really is just people. We will talk about that more in the next movie section, but really just people going to other countries with money that like these people had never seen before kind of money and being like, mm -hmm. here, here's some money, do something fucked up. But then that person might be set for life. Mm -hmm. um, and really taking advantage of these people. It's a uh, proto squid games, I guess. Yeah, it's... Ugh. Um, I would also say, I know we mentioned, it, I have it listed here, um, things like Mondo Kane, um, other extreme documentaries, um, like you can look up like amazing videos, like car crash footage, uh, extreme sports, sports bloopers, compilations, uh, scare films about driver safety. Oh, like God. I would put all of that kind of thing in this category where it's like uh, mostly found footage that is then repurposed to sell a narrative of mm -hmm. whoever's editing the documentary whereas like unfortunately for the mondo Kane, i some of that is a little more maybe they literally might be snuff maybe paid some rebels to like murder people on camera um mm -hmm. but this is all what i would call like rubbernecking video where it's a lot of it's just stuff that happens anyway. It's the same as going to like Live Leak when that was website was still around and just I think it's like, still doing things. Really? I, I I know one of those websites got taken yeah. down, but yeah, it's it's you know, it's like going on to like a YouTube alternative and looking mm -hmm. up car crashes and just like, and like, yep, yep. Yeah. It's like it you it used to have to go to a movie theater and sit with like thirty other people and do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you used to you used to have to like pay a ticket and go sit in some place that was sticky. Now you get to do it in your own house and make it sticky at your own accord. And I, I think that's also why... Is that because of the jelly? Like the, the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches? Yeah. Sure. Um, okay, well, actually, I think that's really interesting and worth noting is that a lot of these um, weren't being shown by like reputable movie theaters. Mm -mm. These, you would have to go to like a porno theater to play this. And like literally in the theater next to it might be showing like like 70s full bush style porno. and the Gay theater, Racula gay racula and then like people being decapitated those are like the three films showing at the porno theater in town like mm -hmm. that's the level of like crazy shit that this where this was and i feel like that's part of why a lot of this kind of thing has um that sexual connotation even if it was for some people just like pure rubbernecking or like curiosity yeah um it it, it is directly tied to early porno world because of where they're shown and even yeah. today like looking up some of these uh like um like car crash compilations and sports incidents and like world's worst motorcycle racing accident footages and stuff. Mm -hmm. If you want to buy those DVDs, they're from porn distributors still. Mm -hmm. They're still not even just like, uh, yeah, it, it's it, not even like sports companies selling these. It's still, yeah. they are still tied to this day to some level to uh, yeah. the porn industry. Which huh. there's some interesting back and forward in the timeline. Cause before this, because of the Hayes code to get a lot of more, uh, extreme content past the censors it had to be distributed as educational material so like even the oh god i wish i could remember which book joe bob's brig book that i had read within the past year uh talked about Is how it? there was a whole uh like chain of people that would travel around the country showing educational sex films uh 
which basically involved it was basically like a lot of uh, pseudo porn and then there'd just be like a birth in the middle of it so it would be quote unquote educational <laughs> yeah Whoa. And then, then that was the back of the day. And then uh, contemporary times. Yeah, fucking... Because I was around for the heyday of, like, fucking gore.com and all that kind of shit. And, um, but, like, I know even to this day, if you just scratch the surface on YouTube a little bit, there's so much fucked up vile shit on YouTube that oh, yeah. it's... And there's, like, I don't think there's going to be ever really a good way to moderate all that shit. Because, yeah, I... Uh, I've seen so many, like, ISIS and Taliban, like, decapitation videos. I've seen, uh, like, quote-unquote cartel videos. I've seen fucking videos of the aftermath of things that, like, people from, like, Blackwater have done in Iraq and shit like that. I'm seeing footage now of sh- fucked up shit that's happening with the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Like, and also stuff going on in, like, uh, um, Kazakhstan, I think, is having issues right now. Tons of places. Tons of places are having issues. The fucking, uh, what was the, 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 was it Malaysia that was having the genocide that was caused by Facebook like a couple years ago? I believe so. But yeah. I, there's so many fucking things. I can't keep track, which is the fucked yeah. part. And then also just all the live leaks on social media now. Well, well like, yeah. I was going to say, you don't even have to go that extreme. Me and my friends, um, we haven't done it in a while, but we used to play a game called One Hour Roulette mm-hmm. where you go to YouTube and you would set your search results to the only videos uploaded in the last hour. And then mm-hmm. we just like dare each other to search different words and see who could find like the weirdest shit. You can find so much shit. Like there's, there, we found a dude on who's live streaming on YouTube, like dick out, just taking a dump. <laughs> like zero viewers until we walked in and like. Complete... You're, you're literally playing like Omegle, but on YouTube? Essentially, yeah. Well, but, honestly, like, it does sound kind of fun. But like, <laughs> I, I, I feel like a lot of people don't even realize that that kind of content is happening. Like. Mm -hmm. streaming on youtube and disappearing and like there are children just sitting on youtube all day also which is like autoplay on all this yeah Mm -hmm. yeah they like an eight-year-old could have just as easily typed in haha poop and found an adult man's penis like while he's shitting and like drinking a beer and like grunting (laughs) as easily as my like dumb 20 year olds ass and me and my friends are like that's fucking weird but like i mean and for context for like us yeah that's funny yeah but to a child that's not like no context and doesn't understand like why that could be funny inappropriate yeah bad bad. and then on the flip side of that at least getting back into like the documentary aspect of it there's a lot of stuff put out by like the true crime community big air quotes Mm. Which is uh, that basically I feel like straddles this line in a weird way where I think talking about like crime and understanding the process of like how people do fucked up things and then understanding also the process of like how they get found and how that whole process gets handled afterwards is important. And some of it is kind of a civic duty of understanding the judicial system, but just the weird reveling in uh, the, the actual crimes themselves Start, kind of starts to fall into this like pseudo snuff territory because dear god especially after that fucking uh the the Dahmer series that came out somewhat recently and then just all these weird fangirls just true crime girlies just making com like documentaries after document there's so much fucking shit about Dahmer jesus christ and then just like taking the what snippets that have been released publicly of the victims and not putting the victim's names out, not expecting the families all, and just republishing this shit for YouTube clicks to get AdSense is fucking weird. And yeah. I kind of don't know what to and, think or do with that. And, like, even before that, if you want to get real weird, like, like the weird Tumblr, like, true crime mm-hmm. communities where people are like, um, oh, my dream boy is Dylan Klebold. Like, <sighs> you know, those weird kind of, like, fangirls uh, and fanboys they still for exist. serial killers. And they're terrible and, people. Like... Yeah, this, like, weird exoticism of, like, serial killers to where, like, I could fix them or just, yeah. like... because, like, I I spent a lot of time, like, delving into, like, the Columbine shit because it happened when I was in school and I was a goth, so it affected me directly. But at no point when I tried... So, like, as a teenager, I tried to grab every snippet of, like, bullshit film and footage and all that of that incident. But I don't know. There's a weird where human curiosity starts and stops and then like where the exploitation kind of begins is like a weird fuzzy line and i don't know what to do with that so hooray yeah that's i <sighs> that's something i actually struggled with this episode and going into part two um is something that i've tried to be 
mindful of because I've also lost, frankly, a lot of taste for like true crime content in general. Like I'm kind of just over it. Um, as much as I love like weird cult stories and stuff, like I, I'm just tired. I don't necessarily need to hear all the gory details anymore. And so I've tried to avoid that here as much as possible. Like, you know, I don't need to know how so and so killer did their murders. You know what I mean? Like I, as much as I, there are things about true crime and like that world that I find interesting, like personally, I, I, I think I'm just over it. Like it's not after the your hundredth episode, it's like, I don't need to hear what they did with the knife. I don't need to hear like the details. I'm not, you're not, especially when it's not given in like a scientific, like forensic style. And it's more like they're describing it like you would write in a book, like a non or a fiction novel. You know what I mean? Mm. Like graphic detail is not that interesting to me. And so I will say as we get into the more real world events next episode that is something i did not do and will not do um i will say so one was murdered i'm not going to describe how it happened i'm not going to go into the details i don't want to revel in the suffering of victims um and i don't want to almost put the perpetrators of these crimes on pedestals by over highlighting their like, like their how work. cunning and brutal and just yeah I, I just how alpha chad grinds at blah 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 the the killer yeah, is I, like fuck off i don't find that interesting like um so that is next episode we will have some more we yeah. i have one more though we have, before... we're gonna wrap up on a uh, fucked up but slightly silly yeah so um we are going all the way back to 1958 this is before snuff really existed but i it's such an early and well-known one that i thought it'd be worth talking about uh we're talking about white wilderness <laughs> um, this is a disney documentary about canadian wildlife i know we have it doesn't sound threatening at all does it canadian no. wildlife like what's it gonna do canadian give me wildlife. give me some timmy hordes like what's it gonna do yeah, um, I know we have a lot of Canadian listeners, so they might uh, <laughs> they might find some problems as I describe this. But um, White Wilderness was filmed in Alberta. Um, the entire thing was filmed in Alberta. Mm -hmm. um, now, this is famous for being the documentary where everyone found out that lemmings um, in their mating rush would commit suicide jumping off cliffs. That sort of rumors. Yeah, there's a famous cliff where it's just like a bunch of lemmings, which if you don't know, is a brown rodent that looks vaguely like a slightly oversized hamster. Yeah, they're not those purple little dudes from the video game. They're yeah, a little no. different. No, no, no. Um, they did. They just look like somebody took a hamster, grabbed the corner of the image, and slightly upscaled it. Yeah, <laughs> they're, they're they're cool little critters. Um, they also do not often commit suicide for being too horny. Um, uh, most animals <laughs> don't. On. Hold on. It's not an evolutionary trait for them to commit mass suicide every time before they, they mate? fuck and mate and have offspring. No, shockingly not. Weird. No. Weird. Yeah. So um, I, I don't understand. As I said, our Canadian uh, listeners might know uh, lemmings are also not native to Alberta. Turns out the film crew um, had purchased the creatures from Inuit children in other parts of Canada huh. and then just brought them in in cages um, oh, you mean uh, another step in the long line of North American her uh, heritage of white people showing up, taking shit from indigenous people and putting it somewhere where it doesn't belong? Yep. Sick. And, <laughs> at least they paid the kids, I guess. Uh, at least, they, at least um, they paid the kids and didn't take the kids this time. Jesus <laughs> Christ. Um, but uh, they then took the animals. Mm -hmm. put them on giant turntables and just spun them until they were terrified and like frenzying them. And then they opened the, a gate and they all just like dizzy and terrified, ran off a cliff and like bounced off the rocks and drowned on the waters below. I'm, I'm trying to understand why they felt the need to one, gather that many lemmings. And then we're like, Hey Bob, you know what we should do? Like, I don't know. What you think of Tony? Bob, I think we should take these tiny rodents and spin them. Yeah, the whole thing is absolutely... Why? Because my it's like this Rube Goldberg machine of bullshit. <laughs> yes, it, like, just to what? throw some non-indigenous non animals into the Bow River. Just 
just because they because someone thought it would look good for a Disney documentary. It's a like, Disney documentary, like there's probably like a Steamboat cool... Willie cartoon Dude, shown before this. There's fucking animals do so much cool random. You're in Canada. If you wanted to film like animals doing deathly spooky, crazy, dramatic things, just go find a moose. Yeah, even just, if it's just fucking standing. There. Yeah, just take some peanut butter, put it like eight feet off the ground. A moose will appear <laughs> eventually. Yeah. Um. So yeah, this is. This is the weirdest ugh. one. It also 58 way before snuff even existed. But I will say while this is one of the best known cases, I guarantee you that there are tons of other documentaries from that era that did all kinds of fucked up shit. Mm-hmm. I mean, we even talked about like Mondo Kame and them paying rebels to do shit. Mm-hmm. And so, but technically, according to the CIA, a snuff film has never been made. Um, I don't believe them. <laughs> I don't. It's because all of them are, like, in their closets and in their video collections. (sighs) I'd say, fuck, I, yeah, I don't know, man. Just fucking, the amount of shit I have seen that's fucked up for fucking free, I refuse to believe that there's not some asshole that's been able to gather X amount of money to convince people to do X, Y, and Z and record it. I, well, next week, mm-hmm. um, we're getting, this is where we're going to end it for this week. Mm-hmm. Well, uh, final thoughts. But uh, next week, I have some more things that would, might fit in the snuff category that aren't feature films. Um, there's some performance art pieces mm-hmm. that I thought were interesting. There's some internet um, urban legends and events that I think fit that will be interesting to talk about. And then we're going to talk about um, the in- the one or two instances of like snuff happening in World of Darkness lore that I think is interesting. And then some more ways you could bring it in on your own. Hey, guys, do you want to throw this shit to your game? I mean, nothing's stopping you. Yeah. but Honestly, um... it's kind of cool. Like... It'd be an interesting thing to put in your game as like a, I don't know, a pivot point or or some sort of hook, you know, like you found this snuff film and I don't know, there's a clue of some sort in the background to show you that this might be tied to X vampire. I mean, I know Sarah mentioned 8mm, and maybe I can look up some more recommendations for next week of other media that is completely fictional and has never been mistaken as snuff. Mm-hmm. That's about it. Like, I, I know um, it's kind of one of the things, even like a lot of procedural dramas technically have a lot of snuff I, I'm pretty sure there's some episodes of Law and Order SVU that I have some it. fucking episodes. I think, I think there's a Hannibal episode where there's a guy who's filming stuff. I can't remember. It's been a yeah. couple of years since I've watched that now. But uh, there's a lot of... I mean, there's also... Um, Oh, what are they called? They're one of my favorite hunter organizations from Hunter the Vigil. Um, we're on the internet and we're going to go catch footage. Oh, we're... Project X? Was it Project um, X? Oh, uh, fuck. Or Project Zero. Something like that. Hello, Editing Hunter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fuck. <clears throat> Network Zero. Network, Network Zero. Zero. Yeah. There it is. But essentially, they were just people filming supernatural stuff and putting it on YouTube and being like, or sending each other links and being like, I think we caught one on footage. Mm. Like, there is. That's something you could bring in. I might bring up. Um, that's a group I could probably do a whole episode on someday. Oh, for sure. But um, yeah, so next week we'll talk about a couple more real world events. And then uh, we'll talk about the fun, cool, not Your real stuff. Hunter yeah. is going to lead us further into darkness and then land us safely back into the cozy world of World of Darkness. Yeah. Hey. 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 So I guess thanks, Paralyze, for the Muzak. They do exist on Bandcamp. They got a bunch of cool shit. You should check them out. Uh, we exist on Twitter at Blank Bodies. We also have Instagram and Tumblr at Blank Bodies Pod. We have a TikTok at Blank Bodies Podcast. If you think our media analysis on the genre of snuff within the grander horror context is worth a couple of dollary dues, we do have a Patreon. That's true. <laughs> um... <laughs> And as I pay us to talk about snuff, pay pay me to talk about fucked up shit. As um, I as as we I have more time to devote to this, I would love to do more weird deep dives like this. This one it's kind of an experimental episode, mm-hmm. um, just to see if people like it. And we'll do the part two that's a little more world of darkness and tabletop focused. But I feel yeah. like having like some real world anchoring and inspiration is important when you're dealing with topics like this. Um, and I also think it's just such a weird topic. It's a weird topic, and I think there's something to be said for the. Uh media analysis and or having proper context for covering heavier and quote-unquote mature themes in your horror games 
because I'd rather at least play games and have stories that involve like an understanding of, oh, these are real people involved. Here's what has happened and understanding of it as opposed to like just throwing in edgy shit to be edgy. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, as we'll get into a next episode, too. But as, as we de- dial deeper and deeper into a technological world, like these things end up on footage, whether they intended to or not. Yeah. And how is that handled? Yeah, and how do you react to that? And what does that mean in the context of your society and your player characters and all that fun stuff? Um, if you want to talk to us about that or, uh, you know, whatever projects you're working on, uh, we do have an interview series. You can hit us up at Blank Bodies at Gmail if you want to talk to us. Uh, if you want to psychoanalyze us, tarot readings. Um... Please don't send us any snuff, though. Don't send us any snuff. Honestly, I would love to talk to people that are involved in like the spicy accounting and or porn world about like more extreme stuff and how that's handled because i would assume the consent talks and how that gets paid out is fucking fascinating i'm sure um also on our patreon we have uh we have everything from discord titles to the ability to vote on polls on what we covered this was actually one of the things i threw on the poll randomly and people were interested second most interested the most interesting topic i think needs a little more research so i'm taking my time on that Um, yeah i saw the polls as this was happening and i was just like you motherfuckers i love you all but god damn it so yeah this (laughs) this was uh more experimental for me trying different stuff but it's also what you guys wanted to hear so um i've had fun with it but yeah uh, we're gonna we're gonna keep doing more polls there uh because twitter you have to pay for it to have the ability to use polls um and we're not giving musk money so we'll just fuck them we're just gonna put it on our uh patreon but um yeah so we're gonna we're working on getting show notes up there um we have tiers where you can get everything from character sketches to blood to tubs of corn i should that corn tub baby i should by the time this episode comes out have uh my college stuff caught up and i should be able to have uh the resource master document list done oh shit i should oh shit hell yeah Oh, you guys are going to all realize how psychotic I am. Yay. I mean. Hooray. This side of the table already knows. Yeah. <laughs> like, we've lived with you. We, girl, yeah. we've been knowing. I already done knew. <laughs> I've done. Um, I've witnessed firsthand. You have, and I'm in sorry. The act. <laughs> I don't think you've ever walked in. Huh? Never mind. Hey, oh. Oh. Hey. Gross. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't know. I cramered so often that. You have. Who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's a good note. Well, we got a second part to this, so we'll do final thoughts then. Yeah. But uh, I need to go wash my brain. Yeah, thanks for making it to this point. Word. Yeah. You're strong, willed, and brave. Congratulations. I'm going to go watch Pedro Pascal yeah. edits. Oh, right, I don't want to give a kiss that. after that. That's what? what he's, he's, he's charming. I think he right. meant the snuff thing. Oh, not yeah. the snuffs. No, yeah. no, 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 no. It's just him being delightful, set to like fan music. Mm. All right. See ya. <laughs> Bye. I was just trying to think of a palate cleanser.